I am a believer that feminism as we know it is a psyop, is a psychological operation. I talk a lot about psychological operations. As a psychiatrist, I have some insight into what the ingredients might be for the manipulation and specifically trauma-based mind manipulation of the masses through tactics that fundamentally disempower, induce fear, and then render dependent those who any given authority might be seeking to control. The combination of some alt history perspectives discuss it as a Rockefeller funded movement, this socially engineered feminism movement that had the result of bringing women into the workplace, right? And actually having us demand that we have a place in the workplace, right? We have a position there, rendering us taxpayers, removing us from the home and specifically from the primary caretaking of our children, which then necessitated that they be warehoused in industrialized educational systems, making them, you know, conditioning them into good workers. The result of this egalitarian mindset is such that we are disconnected from all that would have conferred our feminine impulse to our lived experience and awareness. And we did the thing, right? <laughs> We're girl bossing all over the place. We have the income parity. We have the opportunity. We have the entitlement on many different dimensions that we can expect to be regarded with equality. And I'm not sure that there is a woman I know who imagines that there's such a thing as truly balancing mothering, let alone self-care, self-exploration, self-development, self-pleasure, and working, right? Especially, you know, in a corporate setting. So you combine this movement, if you will, that somehow achieved women begging, demanding, and otherwise expecting exactly what it is that would serve to disrupt the potential power of sacred union between a man and a woman and the sacred dynamic between a mother and her children. And you have a very familiar pattern, right? Where we end up asking for exactly what it is that would further the agenda. So you combine that with the new age movement, which I have also come in a you know blog I wrote on spiritual bypass. You can learn more. I've also come to see as a at least dimensionally and as it was seeded in multimedia efforts and dissemination and supported specific gurus, specific speakers, the new age movement, I have come to see also as a side up. So in this new age movement, you also have the encouragement of men to feel their feelings, to eliminate their anger, to apologize, you know, for their existence in many ways to women. And you also have largely the decentering of more segregated, you know, gender connection, right? So like the brotherhood, the tribalism, you know, sort of men going out hunting, shooting, otherwise spending man time together. The new age has encouraged men like women to feel feelings. I'm not sure, and, and many agree with me, that men actually need help feeling their feelings. It might be the case that what men need help with is getting in touch with their strong spine, cultivating that sense of self-possession and unwavering consciousness. Whereas as women, I don't know about you, but I needed many, many years of work to begin to even generate awareness of my feelings, let alone learn how to feel them. And I really don't need much help with my spine. Right? I need help with my heart. And so this inverted polarity has rendered us in a position where we can't possibly come together and meet each other's needs because we don't have an awareness of what our fundamental primary essence, as David Data would call it, or our needs are. And we are so practiced in exercising the defenses that keep us from that awareness of our needs. And we are so brainwashed around not even imagining that we're entitled to want the things that we need and maybe even feeling ashamed or wanting to play these more traditional polarized gender roles. We've come to believe all sorts of interesting things. So I have like a little list here, right? So 
We've come to believe that women have suffered and are now entitled. We've come to believe that women can do what men can do and don't need them. Women should act strong and independent. Women know better how to do things. Women should hide their sexual energy unless they want to invite harm. There are sluts and there are respectable women. Men owe women. Men are violent and savage fundamentally. Men only want to take sex. Men are stupid, actually. Men can't control their sexual impulses. Men who don't acknowledge a woman's sexuality are actually respecting them. So I have believed all of these things. As I mentioned in my introduction, I was a card carrying righteous bitch feminist from probably like the womb. I don't know. And I very much aligned with the part of me that found survival through, I've got this, I can do it. Let me fix it. You know, that immature masculine dimension of myself that found the experience of feminine energy and emotion so terrifying that I would literally do anything immediately reflexively not to feel any feelings. Okay, so that's who and how I developed uh, to be because of my experience in my you know early years. And I also was very excited about many little bait traps that were set for us feminists, including things like the HPV vaccine that came out to, you know, theoretically help women to never struggle with the side effects of sex, if you will, right? Like that's sort of like the rubric is, you know, you're going to catch this thing and this thing is going to cause a cancer in your body and kill you. I mean, there's like eight layers of, of victim fueled mythology in, in that whole belief system. Nonetheless, when that came out, I felt like we had scored one for team woman. I absolutely believed that, you know, childbirth was a cardinal inconvenience that if you choose to have children, then you should really schedule an elective C-section because why would you ever subject yourself to, you know, discomfort and pain when you don't have to, when you can avail yourself of the gifts of modern medicine. I myself continuous cycled, it's called, which is a euphemism for allowing a pharmaceutical to hijack my endocrine system. And I took birth control for 12 years straight because I found any reminder of my feminine body to be a nuisance and an inconvenience and something to complain about. So before I was in a position to awaken to the greater truth about the medical system, I just translated all of that energy uh, in, into my activism when I did wake up. So then I became, you know, an angry activist and I still was fighting to win. I still was, you know, <laughs> Joan of Arking, like running naked on the battlefield with my sword aloft and all of that same energy of, I will defeat you, you know, whether it's my body when I was thinking all those, you know, conventional things, or whether it's the industry or system aggressor, it was still very alive. And I call it the erotic caress of the enemy because in the activism space, there is an obsession. There's like a literal obsession with the energy of that, which you seek to defeat. When you're thinking about it, you're exploring it all the time. I mean, it's just this um, endless focus and that's not sovereignty, right? Sovereignty is recognizing there's nothing to be, <laughs> nothing to see here. Let's go over there where it's more fun. I have only recently come to recognize that what was driving all of my self-identity and associated choices all of these years prior to, I would say like the past two <laughs> is fundamentally a fear that I believe all women possess at their core. One of the core drivers that if unexamined, if unmetabolized is such a source of projection and associated struggle, like ongoing unresolvable struggle, that it is the place to start. It's honestly like the deepest part of the pool is where you got to jump in, which is that we are fundamentally afraid of being killed by a man. And Alexander Lowen is a psychiatrist who wrote a tremendous book called Fear of Life. 
And in it, he talks about the edible complex and kind of resurrects this, the bathwater that was thrown out with the baby of Freud's work to remind us that in that triangle of early childhood, in that experience of our opposite gender and same gender caregivers, there are some powerful dynamics. And with women, there is the the fear that develops that we will be killed for our sexual expression. Now, as children, sexual expression can be literal, you know, like you're caught masturbating or something like that. More often, it is the expression of vital force. So this idea that Eros, that, that vital force energy is coursing through us from toddlerhood. And it's the same thing that makes you dance around in a tutu and jump on the couch and all of the ways that your animation is an inconvenience at best and a threat at worst to your parents becomes manifested as the coupling of shame and punishment with that vital force. So whether your mom yells at you for jumping on the couch or you know you have an experience of sexual abuse with your father or you're caught masturbating you know, in your room and punished for it, there are many ways that we carry forward into our adulthood that it's safer to develop a relationship to our sexuality that is very strategic. And for most of us women, that involves either rendering it invisible, right? So becoming that buddy, you know, to our male friends or otherwise more Puritan relationship to our sexuality through dress and habits and expression. But then there's also another shadow dimension of relationship to our sexuality where we end up working with it to manipulate, to seduce, and to drive this battle to the death competition with men, even as we're attracted to them, right? There's this sense of of fierce competition and rage that is just, just beneath the surface of the use and you know, employment and leveraging of our sexual energy to gain that leg up, that sense of uh, surrogate safety. So when he talks about the castration dynamic is an essential part of this examination of how it is that men also develop shame associated with their vital force energy and their yang energy and their animalistic aggression which is that they are raised by mothers who fundamentally felt hurt or disempowered by men, specifically potentially around their own vital force energy. And now they're raising sons who are in a position to secure love from their mothers only when they are pleasing them, right? So the quiet, good boy, the nice guy, right? Those are the ones who secure the love of their mothers. So fundamentally, we have created a situation where women are in their defensive, manipulative, control-based management reflex, and men are in their appeasement, fear of women, you know, cowering, dancing around, castration dynamic, many of them, even those who are seemingly more, you know, sort of expressed in the entitlement, narcissistic realm, you know, who are more sort of like machismo, they are still fundamentally afraid of women. And we are still fundamentally afraid of men. So this fear unacknowledged is what can perpetuate not only this cycle of warfare fundamentally, but also it's like a membrane and you can't pass through it to understand how it is that you might want to, as a man, step into dominance, step into alignment with your killer impulse, step into this comportment towards caretaking, honoring, and adoring women. And as women, we we can't pass through that membrane to see how it is that we might want to submit to a more powerful field of energy in our midst, how we might want to serve and devote ourselves, how that might actually be the only way to meet the needs that we so deeply have around that complementarity and around that polarity. It's possible that the only way we can touch God in male-female relationships is through 
this organization of our energies and coming into a deep understanding of our, our different roles.